It is no surprise that the conditions on our home planet have continued to deteriorate over the decades. Overpopulation, climate change, and the threat of nuclear annihilation are just some of the harsh realities that have recently come into focus. Scientists are hard at work trying to find solutions for the continuing survival of our species, and some believe we must leave Earth and colonize our solar system to better increase our chances. To that end, NASA has finally revealed a plan to colonize Venus. Let's take a closer look. Venus, the second planet from the Sun, is the hottest and brightest planet in the solar system. The scorching planet is named after the Roman goddess of love and beauty and is the only planet named after a female. Venus may have been named after the most beautiful deity of the Pantheon because it shone the brightest among the five planets known to ancient astronomers. In ancient times, Venus was often thought to be two different stars, the evening star and the morning star, that is, the ones that first appeared at sunset and sunrise. Observations of Venus in the space age show a very hellish environment. This makes Venus a very difficult planet to observe from up close because spacecraft do not survive long on its surface. Venus and Earth are often called twins because they are similar in size, mass, density, composition, and gravity. Venus is only a little bit smaller than our home planet, with a mass of about 80% of Earth's. While Venus shares many similarities to Earth, there are other characteristics where the two planets couldn't be more different. The interior of the planet is made up of a metallic iron core that's roughly 2,400 miles wide. Its rocky mantle is roughly 1,200 miles thick, while the crust seems to be mostly basalt. Additionally, Venus is the hottest planet in the solar system, making it impossible to sustain intelligent life. Although the planet is not the closest one to the Sun, it has a dense atmosphere that allows it to trap an incredible amount of heat. This is a more advanced version of the greenhouse effect that helps keep the Earth warm. Because of this, temperatures on Venus can reach 880 degrees Fahrenheit, which is enough to melt lead. Several spacecraft have successfully landed on the surface of the planet, but only survived a few hours before being destroyed due to the heat. In addition to the scorching temperatures, the planet is known to have a hellish atmosphere that mainly consists of carbon dioxide, clouds of sulfuric acid, and trace amounts of water. The planet's atmosphere is also the heaviest of all other planets, which is why it has surface pressure that is 90 times that of the Earth. This is similar to the levels of pressure that exist 3,300 feet deep in the ocean. The surface of Venus is extremely dry. This is mostly because, during its evolution, ultraviolet rays from the Sun evaporated any water on its surface quickly and kept the planet in a prolonged molten state. Today, there is no liquid water on the planet's surface because the scorching heat created by its ozone-filled atmosphere would cause any water to immediately boil away. Around two-thirds of the Venusian surface is covered by flat, smooth plains that are home to thousands of volcanoes, some of which are still active to this day. The planet has several surface features that are unlike anything found on Earth. One example is the ring-like structures that range anywhere from 95 to 1,300 miles wide scattered all around the planet. These structures are thought to have formed when hot material beneath the planet's crust rose and warped its surface. Enter Venus, NASA's latest candidate for an unprecedented human space colony. While no human has set foot on the planet yet, it is no stranger to visiting spacecraft from Earth. It has been the destination of no less than 20 probes over the decades, with the United States, the Soviet Union, and the European Space Agency all participating. The first craft to enter a close orbit around the planet was NASA's Mariner 2, which came within 21,600 miles of the planet in 1962. This made Venus the first planet ever to be observed by a passing spacecraft. The distinction of being the first spacecraft to land on another planet's surface went to the Soviet Union's Venera 7 when it landed on the surface of Venus in 1970, while Venera 9 was the first to send back photographs of the Venusian surface. NASA's Magellan Orbiter was influential in generating maps of 98% of the planet's surface while showing features as small as 330 feet across. A craft called Venus Express spent eight years in orbit around Venus to closely study the planet thanks to the large variety of instruments on board. 
it was able to confirm the presence of lightning on the planet during its stay. In August of 2014, as the satellite began wrapping up its years-long mission, it engaged in a risky maneuver that plunged the craft into the outer layers of the planet's atmosphere. The craft survived this dangerous journey and moved back into a higher orbit around the planet where it stayed for several months before eventually running out of propellant and burning up in its atmosphere. The Akatsuki mission from Japan launched to Venus in 2010, but the craft ran into engine problems during its initial approach. After using its smaller thrusters to correct course, the craft was able to spot another huge gravity wave in the Venusian atmosphere. Latest developments for studying Venus further come in the form of two sister missions that aim to better understand how the once habitable planet became the inferno-like world capable of melting lead on its surface. These two new projects have been awarded $500 million in funding each and are expected to launch between 2028 and 2030. They were selected from a batch of four possible missions selected by NASA's Discovery Program in 2020. We don't have an immense amount of information about the second planet from the Sun, but in 2016 NASA computer models of Venus suggested it might have had a habitable surface temperature and shallow water-filled oceans for up to 2 billion years. But how that landscape turned into the uninhabitable hellscape Venus appears to be today is unknown. Veritas and Da Vinci Plus could help reconstruct what happened on Venus that led to a runaway greenhouse effect. Understanding this process of Venusian climate change could be crucial to understanding how our own planet's climate is changing. Models suggest that the hellish surface of Venus may have once been habitable thanks to a shallow ocean of liquid water, cooler surface temperatures, and a thin atmosphere similar to Earth. These models are similar to those used to predict climate change on Earth, and when researchers used them on Venus, they discovered the possibility that the planet may have supported life in the first two billion years of its existence. However, present-day Venus is not quite as welcoming. The barren planet is known for its suffocating levels of carbon dioxide and temperatures that may exceed 864 degrees Fahrenheit. While the Earth and Venus are thought to have formed from similar materials, these materials evolved differently on Venus due to its proximity to the Sun. Venus is also known to rotate much more slowly than the Earth, with one Venusian day equating to 117 days on Earth. Initially, the planet's slow rotation was attributed to its thick atmosphere, but new findings show that this might not be the case. Data from NASA's Magellan mission was used to simulate what Venus would have looked like billions of years ago. This was done by filling lowlands with water and factoring in a thinner atmosphere and a dimmer ancient sun. It was found that ancient Venus likely had a much drier landscape than Earth, which would have limited the amount of water evaporation from its oceans. The slow spin of the planet would have warmed the surface and produced rain that creates a thick layer of clouds. These clouds could have helped with lowering temperatures on the surface, giving life a chance to thrive on the planet. This hypothesis makes it very possible that Venus supported life at one point in time. With its runaway climate change and rolling toxic atmosphere, Venus would be a pretty unpleasant place for humans to inhabit in its current state. Its atmosphere is dense with poisonous carbon dioxide and nitrogen, and howling with 200 mile per hour winds. Its surface is a furnace with an average temperature of 864 degrees Fahrenheit. However, NASA may have a plan that just might work. The idea, proposed by Alex Howe, an astrophysicist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, is to construct vast, porous structures, rafts in essence, that, because they're less dense than the air underneath, would float above the most toxic layers of Venus's atmosphere. Howe's scheme is ambitious and costly to the point of absurdity. Even if it was green-lighted and funded, it might take 200 years from start to finish. However, scientists agree that, technically speaking, it is very much a possibility. The connected rafts, made up of hollow-linked sections the size of city blocks and together forming a flexible surface, would have to cover the entire planet. Powerful machines could begin to alter the air above into a mix that's breathable by people. Changing the hotter, more noxious and windier air below the rafts would be a longer-term project. Once the top layer of air is breathable, people could live and work on top of the rafts. From there, scientists and engineers could closely study Venus and its hot, carbon dioxide and nitrogen atmosphere, perhaps probing its past to explain why a planet that was once a lot like Earth became a poisonous hellscape. But the main justification for building these cloud cities on Venus isn't for near-term science. If it was, remote and robotic probes would make much more sense. The interest lies primarily in the spirit of exploration. 
the Moon and Mars are likelier candidates to host humanity's first permanent off-world colonies. But as a new home for our species, Venus has a certain appeal. The planet's near Earth-like surface gravity, an atmosphere thick enough to provide robust protection from cosmic rays and UV radiation compared with Mars, and a shorter travel time from Earth are the leading reasons. Howe's Cloud Cities could start with robotic probes carrying solar-powered machines to Venus. The highly autonomous machines would suck in carbon dioxide and spit out oxygen and carbon. We'd store the oxygen for future use while using the carbon to build 300-foot-wide hollow tiles with enough empty space inside to make them very light, indeed light enough to float. The great thing about mining carbon from Venus's unbreathable atmosphere is that taking out all that carbon begins to change the chemical makeup of the air. It eventually becomes a mix of oxygen and nitrogen that people can breathe, starting with the lighter upper layer. Link those carbon tiles together and we could cover the entire planet at an altitude of 30 miles or so, high enough to get above the worst of the planet's brutal winds and heat. Here's the rub. How calculated that it would take 72 trillion tiles to complete the sprawling, floating planetary foundation, and we'd have to keep making new tiles to replace the ones that break, most likely from wind shear, while also patching holes resulting from occasional asteroid impacts. And of course, the project wouldn't just end there. Once we've got our foundation tiles, we'd start adding layers until we've built up a continuous surface thousands of feet thick and remaining hollow. We can store all that extra oxygen, the byproduct of our carbon mining, inside the hollow ground, at least until it becomes a fire hazard. The first few colonists could emigrate from Earth to Venus before the thicker surface is complete. They'd live in enclosed domes, or they could help oversee the ongoing construction. But let's imagine we've spent trillions of dollars and, after a century or so, built rafts 30 miles over the Venusian surface. We're still not even ready to send in the rest of the new colonists to Venus because they'd have nothing to drink. This is because water is very scarce on Venus and is the one major commodity we'd have to import from off-world. Sustaining cities, farms, and natural biomes on Venus could require a volume of water equal to a cube with sides 40 miles long. That's a lot of water, as in more than a quadrillion gallons. Hal proposed that, for starters, we strip mine ice from Ceres, a chilly dwarf planet in the asteroid belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. We'd build an enormous elevator on the surface of Ceres and slowly lift the bulky, heavy ice into space, where rockets, most likely built and fueled at nearby human outposts, would nudge it toward Venus. But Ceres would eventually run out of mineable ice. This is why scientists believe that Mars is a much better candidate for colonization. Despite appearances, Mars might be a fairly wet planet. The water that once formed oceans on Mars now lies underground at the North and South Poles, mostly in the form of ice, and will be enough to sustain a human colony on the Red Planet. If you like this video, please consider taking a look at this one, which talks about the James Webb Space Telescope and how it may have proven the existence of the multiverse. Do you think NASA should spend resources to colonize Venus? Please share your thoughts in the comment section below.